Hi, my name is Melvin, and October is the best month. Welcome to Cinematic Doctrine, a non-spoiler Christian movie podcast where we take Spooky Month very seriously. And this time, we'll be talking about Todd Phillips' Joker. This is going to be a bit of a weird review considering the subject matter. For anyone who's been keeping up with the news surrounding the film, whether you've been reading about it for months or you're only now hearing about it, it's been steeped in controversy from the start and I can't say that I much care for any of it. But I also can't say it's not important. A film itself exists at a point in time it was made, so no doubt we'll be digging into what some publications are calling a dangerous movie. But also I really want to have time to talk about the film itself and because of that we have a lot to discuss. I wanted to make this introduction very short, so let's get you guys a quick background of what Joker's all about. The year is 1981, Gotham City. Arthur Fleck lives patiently with his mother, taking care of her and her condition, as well as making ends meet as a clown for hire. He's always been told by his mother to smile and put on a happy face, and that his purpose was to bring laughter and joy to the world. And he sought to live his life in a way that, no matter what, can bring joy to everyone. But that's hard. That's really hard. That's really hard when you're beaten by a gang of no-good thieving children. That's really hard when you can't hold back uncomfortable, inappropriate laughter. That's really hard when you're mocked by womanizing rich punks on a train. So goes the world of Joker, a movie where you already know the ending. And as we witness the horrific origin story of who will soon become Batman's greatest arch-villain, there's still a question to be answered. Is Arthur Fleck's life a tragedy or a comedy? Joker is rated R for strong, bloody violence, disturbing behavior, language, and brief sexual images. I think the best thing to start with when talking about content is the tone of this movie. It's unbelievably dour, and while I felt it towed the line between appropriately comfortable and outright oppressive, I've talked with a few close friends who felt the film had crossed the line into irredeemable hopelessness. It's intentionally miserable, so don't go watch this movie unless you're in the mindset for something difficult both emotionally and visually. Second, the bloody violence, language, and brief sexual images all feed how filthy Gotham is. That said, all of these aspects are used sparingly. Perhaps the most aggressive is the violence, which has less to do with visuals, although those visuals are quite grisly and more to do with the tone surrounding it. It's not so much that someone is dying and it's graphic, it's who's killing them, the circumstances that led up to it, and the treatment thereafter that makes the strong bloody violence feel extra. As for the language, there are quite a few uses of the F word here and there, some uses of the S word, and some lesser curse words. And the brief sexual images have to do with some pinups that Arthur Fleck keeps taped in a journal, as well as a few signs out in the street. All these are snapshots, save for a few of the signs outside, and more or less obscured by the lighting and quick cuts from scene to scene. Now before we talk about Joker, I want to share real quick that if you've come to enjoy Cinematic Doctrine and would like to support the show, be sure to leave a review on your respective podcast app at the end of this episode. Also, check out CinematicDoctrine.com for an interview I had with Like Flint Radio about creative Christians talking about creative writing. We talk a little bit about Cinematic Doctrine as well as some of the stories I like to write in my free time, so go check that out. Also, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you can join other patrons and vote on a movie I review once a month, as well as take joy in feeding my coffee addiction. Any amount is appreciated with multiple tiers to choose from, all of which go toward making Cinematic Doctrine the best podcast it can be. So there's a few things I want to get into with this episode, and I think it'll be helpful for me to make those things clear. I want to talk about the controversial news surrounding the movie. I want to talk about the movie itself, followed by my own reaction to it. And I want to talk about whether or not the news surrounding the film matters. That may not seem like much, but I try not to make these episodes much longer than 20 minutes, and if my track record has anything to say about that, I sometimes get a little long-winded, so if we run a little over time, bear with me. Surrounding this film is a lot of controversy. For starters, in Aurora, Colorado, there was a shooting that took place at a movie theater that was showing The Dark Knight Rises, a Batman movie that had released in 2012. Initial reports stated that the perpetrator who committed the atrocity had been yelling, I'm the Joker, while shooting people in a theater. 
However, these reports were very early during those developments, and as it turns out, they were not true. In fact, as far as the shooter was concerned, he didn't pick the theater for anything Batman related. He chose a screening that was busy purely out of popularity. Yet the correlation was made and people were reporting about potential copycats that may commit a similar atrocity during this year's Joker movie. That is, of course, despite the fact that we've had multiple DC-related films released that featured both Batman or the Joker since 2012. Not only did we have Batman vs Superman, we had Justice League and Suicide Squad. We also had a theater run of The Killing Joke, an animated feature that adapted Alan Moore and Brian Boland's highly praised graphic novel, and multiple short screenings of other animated features which include Batman and Harley Quinn and Batman Return of the Cape Crusaders. In other words, there have been a lot of Batman films since The Dark Knight Rises. So any correlation between a shooting taking place at either a Batman film or DC film featuring Batman-related characters really isn't there. Even so, the Aurora Theater opted not to screen Joker, and Warner Brothers asserted that their film Joker does not encourage nor does it endorse heinous acts of violence. That said, there's been a growing meme culture surrounding the titular character of Joker for the last few years. I'd say it started about summer 2018, or possibly 2017, sometime after the release of Suicide Squad, with Jared Leto's performance of the Joker, when we started to see weird, poorly drawn images of Joker rendered in MS Paint, where the tagline, We live in a society, and other dumb quotes would be put into the caption. The general aura around the meme seemed to target an adolescent attitude around rebellion and other sophomoric philosophical ideations. A lot of it seemed largely ironic, like the meme itself was making fun of itself. But all in all, this was separate from the movie. At least that is, until this Joker movie was announced and people saw that a lot of forum communities like 4chan and sub-communities on Facebook or Reddit were using these memes. That's around the time the internet journalists started to notice a correlation between the kind of film Joker is and the kind of people posting Joker memes. I think they felt that, based on the film being about a down-and-out-of-luck white man living with his mother, there was a correlation between Arthur Fleck's transition into the Joker and the all-too-often school shooter stereotype of a mentally ill, highly depressive, and incredibly violent white incel. Now, I've detailed what incel means before, but I'll mention it again. Specifically, incel means involuntary celibate. So the stereotype goes even further, saying that these people aren't just violent, deranged, and highly depressed, they're also angry over their celibacy. So part of their sexual frustration is to commit violent, unspeakable acts. And so, as many people have seen, there have been a lot of articles published prior to the release of Joker about worries that the film might incite violence. That, again, Arthur Fleck's transition into the Joker would champion the ideal example of all quote-unquote incels who want to enact their twisted revenge on everyone who's hurt them, ignored them, what have you. Then the film landed at Venice International Film Festival, and it was time for Joker to be made available to the public or at least to those attending the festival. Near immediately, the film was praised for its creativity and originality, earning itself an eight-minute standing ovation and rewarded the Golden Lion, which is the most prestigious award one can achieve at that festival. Further on, it screened at Toronto International Film Festival to high praise, but this is around the time we started to see reviews of Joker's potentially dangerous nature, as well as comments on how irresponsible it felt. But by that point, the film was a month away from wide release, and soon it would be in the hands of the general population to decide Joker's fate. Yet even in this time frame, director Todd Phillips found himself derided for comments he made amidst an interview. Phillips is widely known for directing comedies such as Starsky and Hutch, or the well-known Hangover trilogy, yet is now seen making a dark and gritty tragedy. So people were curious, is Todd Phillips done with comedy? In response, he said that he felt comedy wasn't worthwhile and that woke culture has made it a dangerous field to be in, saying that woke culture is full of people antagonizing comedians for being offensive. This, of course, garnered further attention and controversy for Todd Phillips and the film as people rebutted that woke culture doesn't target comedy, it targets insensitivity. Suffice to say, even after the film succeeds in its festival circuit, Gains increased attention, and fans were patiently waiting to spend their hard-earned cash to see Joker, 
controversy continued to surround the film. But maybe you don't care much about all of that. Maybe you're just waiting for me to start talking about the movie, and I get that. But I also found all of this really fascinating, despite also not caring. So I couldn't help but talk about it a bit. So let's talk about Joker, and afterward I'll wrap this up with whether the news and controversy mattered. I saw Joker on October 4th, around 1pm. It was pretty much my wife and I in a theater during the golden hour. In other words, we were probably the youngest couple in the room, and in a theater that could probably seat over 200 people, it was a bit strange to see roughly 30 people in total, but I suppose that's what you get for seeing a movie mid-afternoon on a workday. Either way, my screening experience was intimate and quiet, despite there being other people in the theater. It was comfy, and I'm a sucker for Dolby Cinema screenings since they're such good quality, so all in all, it was a really nice experience. Which is funny because Joker is a really dour film, and no matter how comfortable you're seated, no matter how great the conditions are for your theater experience, the movie will find a way to make you feel uncomfortable. Todd Phillips is featured in a Vanity Fair YouTube video in which he breaks down the opening sequence. In other words, he commentates over the sequence, pauses it, points things out, that sort of thing. It's a really great video if you're at all interested in learning about how a director sees their work, and during the video he makes a comment that the opening scenes in a movie are largely his favorite, and that it's a director's job to solidify the tone with any movie. And I think that's an incredibly critical point to make about Joker, because everything about this film is tonally proficient. It's focused entirely on making the audience uncomfortable, but also inviting its audience into the unbearable filth and grime of Gotham City. The opening sequence contains the background noise of a news radio talking about a two-and-a-half-week municipal strike on all trash workers, and how there are literal tons of trash bags and waste filling the streets of Gotham. Pretty much, if there's a scene outside, there's loads of trash outside too. Meanwhile, there's so much trash buildup that the rats are having a heyday and causing a mutation of super rats to fill the sewers and streets. And if you look closely, you can see these giant rats scurrying throughout a few scenes. Elsewhere, Arthur Fleck is sitting in a locker room preparing his face paint for the next gig, stretching out his mouth in a smile and a frown, indicative of whether his life is a tragedy or a comedy. All of this fed a very abrasive tone, one that takes the weight on Arthur's shoulders and puts it on yours, then asks you to figure out what to do with it. It introduces moments of pain and suffering, existential experiences, trauma, and lays it out for you to make sense of it all. Now this makes the film seem like it's a little sadistic, as though Todd Phillips and Scott Silver wrote this film simply to antagonize the audience, not just Arthur Fleck. And some people feel very strongly about the film being mean-spirited and highly cynical, as though it's trying to hurt your sensibilities just so it can get a few laughs off. Yet, I'm not so convinced of this. My first screening, I felt the film was complex, difficult, and carried a heavy tone, but I never felt as though it crossed a line into oppressive. In other words, I didn't feel like I was being berated over the head with this movie, and Todd Phillips is screaming in my face saying, See? Don't you get it? Everything must go! The world is awful! We live in a society! But also, if I know myself, and I like to think that I know myself, I can be pretty dense at times, so I felt the need to see Joker a second time. So I did. I went on a Tuesday at 2pm, and I was surprised to see a packed parking lot at the AMC, and was even more surprised to see a packed theater as I sat down to watch Joker. I was glad about that, since I got to experience the film with an audience, and as someone who likes to critique film, there's a different way of understanding a film when you get to hear how it influences an audience to participate. Of course, if you've seen the film, you know it was largely a quiet experience. There were maybe two chuckles, a couple of gasps, but nothing like a Marvel or Star Wars movie where everyone's yelling and screaming, I understood that reference, or clapping at certain sequences. So here I am seeing Joker a second time for a multitude of reasons. I needed to know if the film was actually as cynical as people were saying. I wanted to find out if it was better than I initially thought. I wanted to find out if it was worse than I initially thought. And lastly, was there anything I missed that might otherwise change my thoughts entirely? For the most part, my experience was the same, but I definitely would say I enjoyed the film a teensy bit more but I did step away feeling different about the film despite having a better time with it, because this time around I also found it a little worse. 
cue the hundredth time I've contradicted myself on this podcast, right? This still heavily has to do with tone, too. I felt the film was even more successful during my second time around at keeping its tone focused, effective, and convincing. But also I felt that certain aspects of the film felt a little more nasty than my initial experience, and I think a lot of that has to do with knowing what was going to happen next. There were certain story beats that felt a lot harsher, sequences that felt more visceral, and moments of shame that felt more disgusting. But I don't think Todd Phillips and Scott Silva wrote these sequences to beat me over the head. I think they were there to feed the tone. And I think I can't continue this thread without making a declaration here. This film is a tragedy. It's not a comedy. Of course, anyone who's seen it would go, of course it's not a comedy, Melvin. It's practically a horror movie. And yes, you'd be correct, but that doesn't mean one couldn't look at this film as a comedy. In fact, if they did, they'd have to view it with a cynical lens. Most cynicism is angry comedy anyway, but the film is a tragedy through and through, and I think Phillips and Silver are aware of this. At least, I'm confident that they are, because that would convince me as to why there's such a plethora of terrible things that happen in this movie. It's all about giving a solid, convincing reason as to why Arthur Fleck dons clown paint and inevitably turns into Batman's greatest villain. But that doesn't make it any less bearable. Sometimes scenes are simply too sad to put up with. But thankfully, Phillips doesn't linger long on these sequences. Some directors take their time in the misery of their characters. While I feel that Phillips recognizes he's playing with fire and makes sure not to burn his audience. At least, not too much. But also, I think there's a fair amount of catharsis in this film, even if it may be a little twisted. Arthur Fleck as a character is very restrained. A man who so desperately wants to be noticed, comfortable, loved but has been rejected by the world from every corner. And while some critics may feel this aspect of the story wasn't made clear enough to be convincing, I feel it's evident not only in the few interactions we see between Arthur and other characters, but also in the performance Joaquin Phoenix plays. And let me tell you, this is more than a performance. This is some really impressive work. Seeing Phoenix alone is worth the ticket, and I highly recommend it on that. Just that. Go see his performance. What Phoenix brings to the table is more than simply lip service and minor expressions. He brings with him a presence about Arthur Fleck that is very clearly its own thing. From the way he sits, stands, walks, runs, talks, listens, everything is so evidently Arthur that you can read everything you need about this character's history just in the way he exists. And it wouldn't be inaccurate to call his performance a natural choreography, as Arthur not only has a walk about him, but a dance, too. Phillips describes Arthur as a man who has music in him, and it's fascinating to watch as scenes unfold and Arthur dances a little more and more each time. He's a man searching for a place in the world, searching for his song, and that's expressed in the way that he dances. And my favorite scene in the film, if not all year, has to be the bathroom dance scene where Arthur is alone in a dingy, rundown, gross-looking public bathroom and dances all by himself. This comes right at the end of the first act of the film and is basically the first scene where Arthur takes a breather. It's almost like all the stress of the first act finally has a release and we're starting to get a glimpse into the song that Arthur has been hearing his whole life. And there's something beautiful about this being expressed through dance. I mean, have you ever wanted to dance at a party or even dance with your significant other, but felt too embarrassed to do so? You didn't want to do something weird, look funny, or be made fun of, so you just stand there, bobbing to the rhythm of the music, and never really have any fun with it. Something about the dance motif of this movie, how it's used to express comfortability and catharsis, really struck a nerve with me. Also, I probably should have mentioned this during my thoughts on the film's tone, but the music in this movie is quite excellent. I'll probably butcher this, so I'll just use their first name. Hilder has made an excellent score, which, by the way, was strictly produced from the script only. Phillips requested that the soundtrack be completed before production, so that he could use the music to influence how Phoenix performs at certain times, because, like mentioned before, Arthur is a man with music in him. And the music really captures how tense and stressful the world of Joker is, with string instruments being played with hard bow presses and booming timpani drums that toll like a church bell. Interestingly enough, the bathroom scene originally wasn't scripted the way we see it in the movie. In fact, the scene looked entirely different at first, but Phoenix and Phillips didn't think Arthur would do what the script called for. 
So they changed it around and decided, what if Arthur entered the bathroom and danced instead? So Phillips grabbed a piece from Hilder and played it as Phoenix danced around. It's funny to picture Phoenix and Phillips stuck in a dingy bathroom together while upwards of 200 crew members are outside waiting for these guys to finish up their shoot, only to learn they were having a dance party. Honestly, it's just fantastic how much everything comes together in this film, and I haven't even talked about the cinematography, which, by the way, is fantastic. Lawrence Scher brilliantly pictures Gotham in such a stark, intimate manner. It's like you're really there, and all you want to do is take a shower and maybe cry a little, too. And if I can be really honest, I loved the first act of this movie. It had me on the verge of tears the entire time, and I don't mean to say that it's sad. I mean, it is sad, but not the kind that makes me weep. No, I just get really emotional at things I find beautiful, and something about how the first act paints the image of a man downtrodden and rejected by the world was beautiful. Not for the content itself or the scenes by themselves, because what's happening in each scene is painful, harsh, and difficult to bear. What I mean is, I felt as though the film really captured something truthful, and was not only expressing that well through film, it was doing it with patience and care, and that sort of thing just makes me weak. This goes back to the whole cynical perspective of the film. I simply don't think Phillips and Scott wrote those scenes to abuse Arthur and to abuse an audience. I think they desperately wanted to tell a real, relatable, and sympathetic story. So no, I don't feel like the film is lacking in how it portrays a man rejected by the culture he inhabits. We see it as clear as we see a jet engine that's been stuffed into a suburban parking garage. Arthur is a man who wants to comfortably and freely leave his mother's apartment and be a comedian, make relationships, care for people, bring smiles, but everyone has turned a blind eye to him and shoved him into this tight, excruciating isolation. Now, I use the word sympathetic, and I think that's a good segue into whether the controversial news matters. Warner Brothers stated that Joker is not a film seeking to glorify violence. Online publications were worried that the film would encourage incel violence. And even some forums and satire websites were making cynical jokes about suspected tragedies. And no, the U.S. military sending out a bulletin warning about incel violence was not part of those satire publications. That, that really happened. So does it matter? I think at the end of the day, it's both. It matters because news like this converted Joker from a movie into a controversial movie, and in doing so, converts Joker into an event movie. It becomes the talk of the town, so to speak, and everyone has to see it so everyone can have an opinion on it. Not only that, for me personally, I wouldn't be honest if I say I didn't pray each time I went to the theater to see Joker. The mere suggestion that my mortality is at risk puts me on edge, and I think everyone felt that. Heck, I had a friend who couldn't see it opening weekend because there was a threat made to his theater, so it closed for a day or two. Whether or not that threat was legitimate, who knows, but that's the point I'm trying to make. Merely being reminded of our mortality is enough to make us feel mortal. Also, it matters because film and art criticism matters. It's how we understand the time and place we live in. It's how we communicate to the culture around us and how the culture around us communicates back. And to say it doesn't matter wholeheartedly invalidates what I'm trying to do with cinematic doctrine, so I can't really go that direction. Also, as far as the fear of media affecting the real world is concerned, we already see this with a show like 13 Reasons Why, Netflix's heavily criticized series for depicting highly mature content involving characters who are minors. And I don't need to get into the details of that show here since it can be rather provocative, but that's one of many media productions that have made an impact on the world in more ways than simply idle entertainment. Or how about this? The first feature-length film ever made was Birth of a Nation, a highly racist piece of revisionist history that credited the growth of a post-Civil War America to the Ku Klux Klan, which caused the Klan to grow in massive numbers after it released and even saw the film screened at the White House. From the very conception of feature-length films, we've seen the effects that they can have on a country's population as a whole. So to think a film like Joker couldn't be another one-in-a-million film that causes a shift in social relations is an elementary mistake. But also, as I mentioned, controversial news like this doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, Joker wasn't created to incite violence. It isn't like Birth of a Nation, a film that sought to reinvigorate a dying subculture of Klansmen. 
Not only that, Joker is sympathetic insofar as the symptoms of isolation, trauma, and mental health are concerned. It is not, however, sympathetic to the result with which Arthur Fleck becomes Joker. At that point, the film becomes a parable, a cautionary tale speaking to the dangers of quartering off and ignoring those who are in serious need of psychological help. And I want to double down on this sympathetic thing, as there is a really strange scene where Arthur Fleck stuffs himself inside his kitchen fridge. I think back to a really dark time in my life when I was so beaten down by emotional and physical stress that all I wanted to do was embrace the icy cold, wintry parking lot outside my apartment. It would be about 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning, and I would just wear nothing but my underwear and lay in the snow, my skin freezing to the pavement and going numb. I wanted to get away from so much pain that I would rather feel nothing at all. And that's the sort of thing that goes on in your head when you're suffering an extreme trauma. You think really dark, devilish, stupid things that make no sense to someone who hasn't felt the same way. But unlike Arthur Fleck, I haven't covered my face in paint and enacted revenge. And that's where the film goes from sympathy into parable. Because I can't sympathize with someone becoming a murderous killing psychopath, but I sure as heck can sympathize with pain and suffering. And I feel that distinction discredits a lot of the controversial news surrounding the film. There's a very clear point when we're starting to see a change in how we're supposed to interpret Arthur Fleck's descent. Sure, we might even sympathize and feel cathartic about his change, even to the credits of the film, but we're not going to agree with everything he does, and Lord willing, nobody will. One last thought I had before closing this episode out had to do with whether or not films like this matter in general. Tragedies, I mean. And I mean wholehearted tragedies. Films that end in a manner that feels hopeless, or perhaps even with a somber tone despite everything still being terrible. And while I won't dig into this really far, I would say, yes, I think films like this matter. Tragedies are a great learning experience. There are plenty of lessons to be learned in a tragedy, but like I mentioned before, it's like playing with fire. Fire has a purpose. It keeps you warm. It cooks food. And playing with it can be really fun because fire is neat. But if you're going to play with it, you sure as heck make sure you don't hurt anyone, let alone yourself. And please don't burn your house down. That said... Hopefully a future episode opens that topic up for discussion, because I think that's an important one to have. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you've seen Joker, what did you think of it? Do you find it as painfully enjoyable as I do, or do you find this film pretty offensive? If you're listening on Cinematic Doctrine's website, let me know in the comments below, or shoot me an email to cinematicdoctrine at gmail.com. If you're on Letterboxd, I have a list compiling every movie I've reviewed on Cinematic Doctrine with direct links to those episodes, so be sure to check that out, and consider following me on Letterboxd for quick, bite-sized reviews on every movie I watch. If you'd like to support the show, jump on over to Cinematic Doctrine's Facebook page and be sure to follow for updates on episodes, movie news, and my usual shenanigans. From there, you can also get connected with the Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group and join the conversation. You can also support the show by leaving a review for Cinematic Doctrine on your respective podcast app. And if that's not enough, head on over to Cinematic Doctrine's Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you can join other patrons and vote on a movie I review once a month, as well as take joy in feeding my coffee addiction. Any amount is appreciated with multiple tiers to choose from. All of it will go toward making Cinematic Doctrine the best podcast it can be. And a special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier. Thank you so much, Mom and Dad. You're the best. All of this will be available in the show notes. Until next time, stay cool. Stay cool.